Hello guys, I wanted to take some time to explain a bit with you about philosophies <coughs> and knowledge. Now, the two verses that I want to use are the one, two, three, four verses that I want to use. It's Colossians 2, 8 through 10, and 1 Timothy 6, 20. So if you'll open with me to Colossians 2, beginning in verse 8, he says, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. Now if you'll turn with me just a couple pages to the right, you'll find 1 Timothy 6.20, and we're going to read it. So 1 Timothy 6.20, O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoid profane and vain babblings, and oppositions of science, falsely so called. Okay, so the word that was used for philosophy there in Colossians 2 is philosophia. Alright, and just keep 1 Timothy 6.20 in mind because we're going to look at the word gnosis, which is knowledge. Knowledge. So this word philosophia, it comes from Philo, which means to be fond, like in America, it, when people say love, they usually mean fond. They don't mean what the scripture means when it says agape. They mean phil philo or phileo when they say, I'm fond of cake, or I'm fond of nice clothes, or I'm fond of nice cars. They don't mean agape when they say it. They mean this. And Sophia means wisdom. Now, the scripture says that Yahweh is our, is our wisdom, like in Jeremiah chapter 9, where it says, you know, I'm going to go ahead and open there. So, in Jeremiah chapter 9, let me see, Jeremiah chapter 9. And beginning in verse 23, so Jeremiah 9, verse 23, he says, Thus saith Yahweh, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am Yahweh, which exerciseth, that exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness. So there you go. That is true wisdom, is knowing Yahweh. And the way that we have knowledge and experience of, of preaching his word, like it says in Hebrews, it says that by reason of age has his senses exercised to discern good and evil. So, <clears throat> Sophia, in the world's eyes, the goddess of wisdom, is a picture of Eve. Because Eve went and took of the tree because the serpent said that they could do that, and then they would be able to choose good and evil for themselves, is the idea. And that's what it meant, meant when it says it was a tree to be desired to make one wise. And that's what, that's exactly what John is quoting in 1 John when he says, the pride of life, the loss of the flesh, the loss of the eyes, and the pride of life. Those are equal to, and he's simply repeating what Eve brought from the tree of, of that fruit, which was, she saw it was good for food, 
It was pleasant to the eyes and desirable to make one wise. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. And lust means to breathe hard after. Like, you want it. you got to have it, right? So this word pride, a lasagna, it means boasting there in First John. When he says the pride of life, something you can boast about. Like, look how wise I am, right? And that's why, I, that's why Yahweh said in Jeremiah 9.23, he said, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he knows and understands Yahweh, right? So Eve and the serpent and Adam developed this idea of doing what's right in your own eyes. So what are some of these things? that are right in people's own eyes. Well, in the context of what we're speaking here, and we're speaking of truth versus the lie, they have developed this false system, and this word was borrowed by pagan missionaries, called church. Now that word church, kirk, kirk, church, is where we get our word circe, circle, and circus. Now, Circe is the same picture as that woman in Revelation chapter 17 who gave the drink of the wine, and it would turn the people who drank it into beast and swine. And the circle is where we people came up with this idea of prayer circles and holding hands, and they bow their heads in the circles and Wherever but that bow your head concept comes from, right? Some people in Scripture pray looking up. Some people pray down flat on their face. Some people bow their head or prostrate forward. And a circus, we know, is where all these crazy things go on. So, another parallel to understand what a church is, is much like a central bank. Now, if you're blinded by the central bank, which would just be a, a front, it would, it would be like staring in the sun and not being able to see Mercury, Mercury, the planet, because you're blinded by the sun. Well, what happens is all of these small little private banks, these little small private investment banks, will actually be the ones who run and control the central bank. Well, that's the same concept as this system that's been developed in the world called church, is you get these greedy, money-making people who call themselves deacons, but they're not deacons, not in any scriptural sense, and they act as the hiring firm for the church, and they hire what the world calls a preacher, pastor, bishop, elder, and he's none of those things. Because just like it said in Colossians 2, 8 through 10 there, they're spoiled through philosophies. And we're going to go over some of those philosophies. That's why I brought this verse out. And just so we can kind of go step by step here, we're, I'm going to go back to Colossians 2, 8 right now. So, Colossians 2, 8. It's really easy to pass over. All right, Colossians, sorry, one moment, 2, verse 8. So it says, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men. After the rudiments of the world, these arrangements of mankind, and not after Christ. So these guys in these churches aren't after Christ. They've developed their own system. Now, we know from Matthew chapter 18, verse 20, that where two or three gather in his name, in Christ's name, there he is in the midst of them. Now, this later development, and we know it came much later, because 
in the beginning, in, for example, in Exodus chapter 20, I believe it is, he says that it was the, he, Yahweh says that they are, speaking of Israel, they are a kingdom of priests. So then if you open and look in Revelation chapter 1 and Revelation chapter 5 and 1 Peter chapter 2 and also when the scripture speaks of Melchizedek in Hebrews chapter 5 verse or Hebrews chapter 5 6 and 7 that we have been made kings and priests and first, that's what it says in Revelations 1 and chapter 1 and Revelations chapter 5. But in 1 Peter chapter 2, it says that we are a royal priesthood. In Hebrews 5, 6, and 7, it's explaining how we are in the order of Melchizedek. 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 And in the New Testament, they have an S right here. Mel Melchizedek. So, and, and Melchizedek means king of Salem, priest of the Most High God. That's what it says in Genesis chapter 14. But then if you look in Hebrews 5, 6, and 7, it's talking about believers. That's exactly what we are. We're kings and priests, according to First and First Peter chapter two, royal priesthood, Revelation chapter one and chapter two, kings and priests. That's what we are as believers. Now, because Christ reigns in us and we dwell in him and he dwells in us. He is our head, we are the body. The head is in the heavenlies, the body is on the earth. Where the head is, there is the body, where the body is, there is the head. The head can't be without the body, the body can't be without the head. So what we're going into now that we understand that the priesthood of all believers, and like we talk about, and I always mention, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26, where he says, How is it then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you have a psalm, have an interpretation, have a revelation, but let all things be done in order, he explains. And that's the same picture as in, Numbers, chapter 11, verses 25 through 29, when he says that Yahweh took from his spirit and put it upon the 70 elders, and they all prophesied. And two of them remained in the camp and didn't report to where they were supposed to be. And some people came and told, and Moses says, Are envious thou for my sake? I desire that all would prophesy. So, this is the idea of the priesthood of all believers, and that was one of the writings of Martin Luther, the priesthood of all believers. Uh, evidently, he did some studying and was like, hey, the priesthood of all believers, why do we have these priests? Well, now that we've established that, where did this corruption come up in? Where did all this corruption come from? Well, they made these man-made philosophies. And they have these oppositions of science, falsely so-called, in these worldly isms. So that's where I wanted to get to. So anywhere you find this word ism, this means... Philosophy of ism. Philosophy of. So what I did is I went and I went to a couple of my references. And I would like to kind of just give you a, an, a, an example of this. So whenever someone says a fancy word like theology. Well allow me son to explain to you a bit of a bit of this theology and allow me to show you some dispensationalism and some Trinitarianism and Unitarianism and Episcopalianism and Congregationalism and Presbyterianism 
So what they mean is, let me give you my opinion. Let me spoil you, as it says in Colossians 2 there, through my philosophy and vain deceit. Uh, why, seest thou a man wise in his own conceits? There is more hope for a fool than that man. So some of these isms, some of these man-made philosophies, would be such things as the man-made ideas and things like eschatology. Well, this word here would obviously call the mind the study of, and so this Greek word right here is legitimate, right? But whenever people start dropping big words like this, they're usually saying, let me give you a few proof texts. Proof texts are when you use a few disparate or a few faraway passages that are all out of order, not, not even linked together to make up your own doctrine. Your own doctrine and your own dogma, your own man-made ordinances, your own liturgy, your own worship service. So, and then again, another way that they do it besides proof texts is they read into the text. Read into. Go have you believe in stuff that's not even there. And they use proof texts too to read into the text by linking things that and concepts that aren't even identical. So another one of these would be, for example, baptism. You see that ISM there? You see that ISM? That means the philosophy of babto. <laughs> that babto is the Greek word, and it means to stain or to die. So this means the philosophy of some man-made thoughts, just like when you put that ology on there. They're talking about man-made stuff here. And it will be, it, I'll tell you what it will be when you look in these things. It'll be a mixture of truth and a lie. An ism. And it'll be a mixture of a truth and a lie. So when they start talking about theology, well, theology, pure and simple, would mean the Word of God. But when you get a theologian, they're not <laughs> talking about theology anymore. They're talking about their own little philosophy that's made them famous and popular. So before I really go into explaining more of this, I would like to also establish uh, another Ism. <laughs> this idea of church government. Well, we just looked at all the verses that speak of the, the priesthood of all believers. And we know that the scripture does speak of an of an of a oh, like to be superimposed with the watching, right? A episcopo. That's where we get our scope, the word scope, which means that to mark. So the the scripture does speak of a overseership, but not what the world calls a bishop. A bishop is a bishop is a Latin word. It has nothing to do with episcopos, and you've heard of episcopal. Well episcopalianism again is a ism or Presbyterian Ism and the Presbyterian Church are these isms, these philosophies are, what's the other one? Let me find the other one. The other one is, one moment please, I lost my, I lost my place. Oh, okay, so it's under church government. Let me see. Church government. So you have congregationalism, Presbyterianism, and Episcopalianism. So these are philosophies, man-made philosophies. It doesn't bear any resemblance of what the 
Scripture speaks of when it speaks of a presbyter. Or a, a episcopos. Just no, no resemblance whatsoever. There is nothing in the church, or there's nothing in scripture that resembles this thing in the world now called church government. It's like I, it's like I said a moment ago. It's like a central bank is the way they treat it because all they're doing is assembling capital. Now, those that board of deacons and that board of twelve that acts as the hiring firm is who hires the hireling. And as we've shown in Micah three eleven, it says they judge for reward. They the priests teach for hire and the and they divine for money. So it's that's what they're doing. They're assembling capital. Now a lot of people might think that capitalism is a new thing. But that goes all the way back to Adam and Eve when they said, let us, or they said, we can be gods, right? So they were assembling fortunes there by wanting the fame and the recognition as to think that they could be their own gods. And the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is exactly what that is. The, to want more, to breathe hard after, to do anything for an end. So, assembling capital. And just a, another note before I go into more of this again. Government, business, school, and church are made up of people. Well, what kind of people? Well, the scriptures tell us. Wicked people. Because this lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes and the pride of life, even believers struggle with these things. Like, we want more, don't we? The scripture says, plea and neck days, a covetous man is an idolater. And that's in Ephesians 3 verse 5 and Colossians 5 verse 5. And it might be vice versa. It might be Ephesians 5 5 and Colossians 3 5. So forgive me if I got this twisted. But a covetous man is an idolater, and covetous means to want more, and idolatry means to serve what you put into your eyes and ears. And that's found in Ecclesiastes where it says that eye is not satisfied with seeing, the ear is not satisfied with hearing. All things are full of labor. So we labor for the things that we want, like cars, women, houses. And these government businesses, schools, and churches are ran on these principles of assimilating fortunes, capital, profit, that the loss of the flesh, the loss of the eyes, and the pride of life. They they have this show that they've set up called the church, and that's just like going to a an opera, right? You go, you sit down, you watch the show, you pay, and you all go home. Well, that's nothing like what the scripture speaks of, like in Romans chapter 12, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and Ephesians 4, when it speaks of us being of members in the body of Christ. Members. Not church members, not a membership in a church, but an arm and a leg and an eye and a nose and a head. And it says Christ is our head and we are the body. So... When all of these philosophies began to get started, from 0 to about 100 A.D. is when you see the scriptures that you're reading. But then when the real corruption set in was from 100 to 300. So the 2nd century and the 3rd century. So, yes... So after, so the second century, we'll say 101, or we'll say 101 here. So the second century to 200, and then the third century to 300 AD is when the corruption began to set in. Well, why? 
Well, because they forsook Scripture or the writings of the apostles. They forsook the writings. And the Scripture speaks of more apostles than just the twelve. That's another man-made doctrine. Who made up that doctrine? Well, that's what we're going to study. That's what we're going into. Cyprian. It says Cyprian gave the earliest formulation of the doctrines of apostolic succession. And that's what Constantine said, the one who started the Roman Catholic Church. Constantine said, I'm the next apostle. <laughs> that's funny. And the primacy of honor of the Roman bishop in the church. So, Cyprian came up with this concept of apostolic succession and the Roman bishop primacy. Your Highness, let me bow to you, my high, Your Highness, Pope, right? So, Cyprian Cyprian. And it also says, Cyprian tended to think of the clergy as sacrificing priests and offering up Christ's body and blood in the communion service. This idea later was developed into the concept of transubstantiation. Huh? What? This is insane. <laughs> so, um, and, and just for a side note, if one it says, if one can say that Tertullian helped to formulate the doctrine of the Trinity and gave a name to that doctrine, one can also say that Cyprian gave the earliest formulation of the doctrines of apostolic succession in the primacy of honor of the Roman bishop and church. So Tertullian came up with the doctrine of the Trinity. Look it up. And they'll tell you that he followed Theophilus. Not the Theophilus of Luke chapter 1. And Acts chapter 1, but a different Theophilus that came later. So Tertullian, Theophilus, Cyprian, they forsook these early writings and they began to come up with their own doctrines. And Paul tells us why because they wanted to follow the Jews and the Greeks. So the, the Jews. And we'll just say the heathens, whoever it was, right? And the Greeks were so smart with their philosophies, their isms, that the early believers were trying to cater to these really smart guys called the Greeks, rather than preach the pure truth of Scripture. And in this book, he puts it really well, but um, let, me, let me see. So, in this, he says, the idea and institution of a special priesthood distinct from the body of the people, and this is under the heading clergy and laity and where this concept comes from and how it began to develop. So, distinct from the body of the people with the accompanying notion of sacrifice and altar passed imperceptibly from Jewish and heathen Reminences and analogies into the Christian gatherings, right? The majority of Jewish converts adhered tenaciously to the Mosaic institutions and rites. Institutions and rites. So their oral tradition, the Mishnah, the Talmud, the Halakha, Hagalda, the Midrash, the Gemara, the Targums and all of these things. That's why they killed Jesus. Jesus was saying, don't listen to this leaven of the Pharisees, which is their their own teachings and beliefs and behavior and the leaven of Herod, these these ideas of episcopal that began to take over. Because that's not even what a, a episcopos is. That's not what a bishop is in the scripture. A bishop is someone who can identify needs or identify apostates that were coming to the gatherings and deal with them and say, hey, you can't come here and be wicked like that, right? And that's what the elders were there for. 
the elders, the all of the believers are encouraged to be able to identify that, to rebuke, exhort, and things of that nature. So he says, and a considerable part never fully attained to the height of spiritual freedom proclaimed by Paul, or soon fell away from it. He opposed legalistic and ceremonial tendencies in Galatia and Corinth. Paul opposed them. And now everywhere you go, and you see a sign, they tell you what time the, the worship service begins. And like I said, me and my wife passed a, a building, and it said, Come and see why our liturgy is so good. And the liturgy and the worship service is the same thing to them. And that comes from Jewish and heathen tendencies, he's explaining here. Paul opposed that. And although sacerdotalism, or the philosophy of the priesthood, does not appear among the errors of his Judaizing opponents, the Levitical priesthood, with its three ranks of high priest, priest and Levite, naturally furnished an analogy for the threefold ministry of bishop, priest, and deacon. So he's talking about the Jewish corruption here. The Jewish corruption. So you take the high priest, the priest, And the Levite. And he's saying that's a, they took that as an analogy for bishop. So the oh well, sorry. So the high priest and the bishop they're setting side by side. And then the priest and the priest. And the Levite and the deacon. And they're saying this is a good an analogy the Jews wore and came to be regarded as typical of it. It infested the church. Still less could the Gentile Christians as a body at once emancipate themselves from their traditional notions of priesthood, altar, and sacrifice. So this was the Jewish one right here. Their analogies of this. But then the, the heathens analogy of this same thing would come over here would be priesthood, altar, uh, altar, and sacrifice. So you have the heathens here and the, the Jews here. So heathen, Jews, and then the true believers. And they're trying to mix all this together. And this is why I'm always telling y'all about syncretism. Syncretism and ecumenism. Because they just mixed all these things together into this circus, this circle called church. <laughs> and Circe, because they're transformed when you go into there into swine and strange beasts. So then he goes on to say, on which their former religion was based. Speaking of the, the heathens. The Gentiles, the heathens, whether we regard the change as an apostasy from a higher position attained or as a reaction of old ideas never fully abandoned, the change is undeniable and can be traced to the second century. Isn't that what we said a moment ago? 100 or 101 to 200 is the second century. 201 to 300 would be the third century, right? The church could not long occupy the ideal height of the apostolic age, and as the Pentecostal illumination passed away with the death of the apostles, the old reminences began to reassert themselves. And then I really like this footnote here. He says, Renan, looking at the gradual development of the hierarchy out of the primitive democracy, from his secular point of view, this guy's not even a Christian, and he acknowledges this, calls it the most profound transformation in history and a triple abdication. First, the club, the congregation, committing its power to the bureau, to the bureau or the committee, the college of presbyters, then the bureau to its president, the bishop, who could say, Jesus le club, 
and finally the presidents to the Pope as the universal and infallible bishop, the last process being complete in the Vatican Council of 1870. Wow, that's profound. So it just shows you how they just, every the priesthood of all believers gave it to the Bureau, then the Bureau gave it to the President of the Bureau, then the Bureau gave it to the the to the Pope, to one man. Okay, so there it goes on to say, In the Apostolic Church, preaching and teaching were not confined to a particular class. The upper class, right? Which it is now. Now it's confined to the upper class, but it wasn't back then. But every convert could proclaim the gospel to unbelievers. And every Christian who had the gift could pray and teach and exhort in the congregation. The New Testament knows no spiritual aristocracy or nobility. The le he just said in different words, the leaven of the Pharisees, aristocracy, educated rulers, or nobility. The leaven of Herod, the rulers. But co the governors, right? But calls all believers saints. All believers are saints. The priesthood belongs to all believers. Though many fell far short of their vocation, nor does it recognize a special priesthood in distinction from the people, clergy and laity, right? The pulpit pew system, clergy laity. As mediating between God and the laity. That's exactly what they think they're doing. It knows only one high priest, Jesus Christ, and clearly teaches the universal priesthood. We were just talking about that, universal priesthood as well as universal kingship of believers. It does this in a far deeper and larger sense than the old, in a sense, too, which even to this day is not yet fully realized. The entire body of Christians are called clergy, pleroi, a peculiar people, the heritage of God. Amen. Now listen to the shift here, because now he's going to go into explaining to you some of these names who began to corrupt it. On the other hand, it is equally clear that there was in the apostolic church a ministerial office instituted by Christ. For, or, so he hasn't shifted yet. So, For the very purpose of raising the mass of believers from infancy and pupillage to independent and immediate intercourse with God. So helping people understand that there's no barriers between them and God. But you're not going to make money that way and, and assemble capital when you, in your private investments in your central bank-like church if you tell people that they go directly to God. It's not going to work. <clears throat> to that prophetic, priestly, and kingly position, which in principle and destination belongs to them all, this work is the gradual process of church history itself and will not be fully accomplished till the kingdom of glory shall come, so that, till the consummation. But these ministers are no are nowhere represented as priests in any other sense than Christians generally are priests with the privilege of a direct access to the throne of grace in the name of their one and eternal high priest in heaven. So we go directly to God now because he's made us kings and priests. Even in the pastoral epistles which present the most advanced stage of ecclesiastical organization in the apostolic period, while the teaching, ruling, and pastoral functions of the presbytery bishops are fully discussed, nothing is said about a sacerdotal function, a priest function. Sacerdotal means priest. The Apocalypse, which was written still later, emphatically teaches the universal priesthood and kingship of believers. Revelation chapter 1, Revelation chapter 5, kings and priests. The apostles themselves never claim or exercise a special priesthood. Amen. That's amazing. Apostle, or, uh, uh, sorry, Paul in 1 Corinthians is saying, like, we're just your fellow helpers. We're working with you. We work together with you. Because they were already starting to elevate people. Because they were saying, one is saying, I'm baptized by Paul. One saying, I'm baptized by Apollo, one saying, I'm baptized by Cephas, Peter, right? And they say, he says, who is Paul? Who is Apollo but fellow laborers? I planted the seed, 
Apollos watered the seed, but God gives the increase. He's leveling himself. He's humbling himself. That's what we're supposed to do. Be humble. Not play dress up and wear a nice ring, like James says, like and show partiality, Paul says, not to be partial. And Jesus says that those who wear the the gorgeous clothing and the soft clothing are in kings' houses and in kings' homes. We're not supposed to behave that way. We're not supposed to play dress up and go and hang out with the aristocrats down at the local church where the nobles and them come together to assimilate capital for themselves. <laughs> That's just insane. The sacrifice which all Christians are exhorted to offer in the sacrifice of their is the sacrifice of their person and property to the Lord, and the spiritual sacrifice of thanksgiving and praise. Amen. In one passage, a Christian altar is spoken of in distinction from the Jewish altar of literal and daily sacrifices. But this altar is the cross on which Christ offered himself once and forever for the sins of the world. And that's why we're supposed to bear our cross. Now the opposite of all of these things right here is when the scripture speaks of death because we're hated and persecuted and resurrection because then we live with God. This means to come to life after dying and we die to the world when we tell them the truth and we resurrect with Christ currently. Resurrection isn't just something that happens after you die. It's something that happens now when you bear your cross. Now this cross is the whole function of scripture. We are pardoned from prison. When the scripture says prison, thulake, that means the boundary between night and day. And aphesis, which is forgiveness, Ephesus, it means to be pardoned and released from prison, Fulake. And that's to come out of death and resurrect. And the, the price that was paid was the precious blood of Jesus. And when we do that, we're showing that we have the name of Christ abiding on us. Because we are obeying Christ and we're following in his footsteps of death, resurrection, burial, in living for God, in living with Christ. And we've been released from our spiritual prison and have been forgiven, Ephesus. Now forgiven, remission, deliverance have all been translated from this word Ephesus, and it means a pardon and release from prison. And the price is the blood of Jesus. That's so important to understand. So important. The mo that's the most important thing. And all of scriptures to identify with Christ in his death, be persecuted, hated, suffer for doing righteousness, for doing what is right. Now, now we're going to see this shift here that I spoke of a moment ago. Sorry, I spoke too soon. Now the shift happens. After the gradual abatement of the extraordinary spiritual elevation of the apostolic age, which anticipated in its way the ideal condition of the church, the distinction of a regular class of teachers from the laity became more fixed and prominent. They became corrupt. The leaven of Herod and the leaven of the Pharisees, they exalted themselves and because they thought they, if you're real likable and people liked you and you had some political sway, they set you up. And these po politicians are the ones who come together and kill us and cast us out of the synagogue and they suppose they do God a service. So it says, it became more fixed and prominent. This appears first in Ignatius. Hmm. Who in his high Episcopalian spirit considers the clergy the necessary medium of access for the people of God. What? What? That should make people indignant. The scripture says to be angry about stuff like that. Whoever is within the sanctuary, he says, or altar, is pure. But he who is outside of the sanctuary is not pure. That is, he who does 
anything without bishop and presbyter and deacon is not pure in conscience. Well, Jesus constantly was rebuking the elders for following their traditions instead of God. Yet, he nowhere represents the ministry as a priest office, a sacerdotal office. The Didache calls the prophets high priests, but probably in a spiritual sense. Clement of Rome, in writing to the congregation at Corinth, draws a significant and fruitful parallel between the Christian's presiding office and the Levitical priesthood, and uses the expression layman, laxos, and anthropos as antithetic to high priest, priest, and Levites. This parallel contains the germ of the whole system of sacerdotalism, the priesthood. But it is at best only the argument by analogy. Tertullian was the first who expressly and directly asserts sacerdotal claims on behalf of the Christian ministry and calls it sacerdotium, although he also strongly affirms the universal priesthood of all believers. Cyprian goes still further and applies all the privileges, duties, and responsibilities of the Aaronic priesthood to the officers of the Christian church and constantly calls them sacerdotes and sacerdotium. He may therefore be called the proper father of the sacerdotal conception of the Christian ministry as a mediating agency between God and the people. Wow. So you can see it's starting to set in there from Ignatius to, to Tertullian in the Didache. And then it says that Cyprian is properly called the father of this. Wow. Wow. During the 3rd century, it became customary to apply the term priest directly and exclusively to the Christian ministers, especially the bishops. In the same manner, the whole ministry, and it alone, was called clergy, with a double reference to its presidency and its peculiar relation to God. It was distinguished by this name from the Christian people, or laity. Thus, the term clergy, which first signified the law the lot by which office was assigned, Acts 1, verses 17 and 25, then the office itself, then the persons holding that office, was transferred from the Christian generally to the minister's exclusive. Solemn ordination or consecration by the laying on of hands was the form of admission into the Ordo Ecclesiastes or Sacerdotalis. In this order itself there were again three degrees, ordinance majors, as they were called, the deaconette, the presbyterian, and the episcopate held to be the divine institution. Under these were the ordinance minors or latter, of latter date, from subdeacon to ostiary, which formed the stepping stone between the clergy proper and the people. They made it up. Man's imagination. See thou a man wise in his own conceits? There's more hope for a fool than him. Now, I, actually, I went over there and grabbed the book and I grabbed the wrong one. So, there, I wanted to tell you a little story about what happened that made me realize this about the institutional church. Well, I realized that they had, that first off, it was just a business. That's the first thing that struck me. And then I noticed that this business, like all businesses, almost have sons daughters, and wives, who are the, the, what's it called, beneficiaries. So when, whenever that person dies, these are going to be the ones who get all the money and get the institution, because it's just a business. Now, that's just bankrupt on morals. If you look at Matthew 10, verses 42 through 45, and if you look at those parallel passages, it says they call them benefactors. The, the ones who are the, 
the ones who exercise authority and exercise lordship. And and Peter says not to exercise lordship in First Peter, and he says not to meddle in other people's affairs, alos episcopos, which is that same word for an episcopal or a bishop, and it says alos in front of it, another. You're not bishoping another's affairs when they're a believer. So you're just marking people who are evil or wicked, or you try to help people, and you're looking out to help people, right? And a pres you, you might be a presbyter, but that's or that's what they, the scripture calls an elder, but that's going to be if you're obeying God, not if you're involved in some church and you're doing a bunch of, you're there just as a business associate. So that's what I began to learn here. It's just a business. And then when whenever that person they call pastor, which is the president, right? He's the he's the CEO. And when he dies, the son or the daughter or the wife is gonna become the new CEO and organize how the business is gonna be ran. And that's why I compared it to a bank. You know, a bank is just a business, but that's why you have government, business, school, and church, and those are all ran by people, and people are wicked. So, and I'm including myself in that. That's one of the things that the scriptures always say. That this, is, this is how people run the show, right? They always run the show as though they are without fault. Even Paul said, oh, oh, wretched man that I am, because he knew that the members of this flesh are corrupt. When it sees things, it likes it, wants it. When it hears things, it likes it, wants it. And it's proud. The flesh is. But with our mind, we serve God. And we focus our mind on God and pray to God, lead me not into te to temptation, right? Don't let me fall into these sins. Like when, when Jesus said, if you even look at a woman to lust after her, you've committed adultery already. Wow. Wow. That is a stunning thing to say. And, you know, we pray to God and we say, God, please humble me. Like, crush this flesh in me that wants to do all these bad things and wants to exalt itself. And that's what we find happened and it's not hard to understand what happened with those people we just read about is that the positions and the power and the recognition became a stumbling block and people began to want to they view themselves as the mediators between God and man which just isn't true now we teach and we instruct to the point that we want people to come to the knowledge that there is no longer a middle ground between man and God. Jesus Christ is God. So we recognize him and we call him Curios Lord. And that's why they persecuted Jason because he said that Jesus was Lord. And they called Caesar Lord. And they said these men are saying that there's only one Lord, Jesus, not Caesar. And that's exactly how it is. Jesus is Lord. Not these men who have set themselves in these worldly positions that bear no resemblance of what the scripture speaks of when it speaks of bishops, pastors, shepherds, priests, elders, all of these different things. And then they're just usurping authority and they think that they're there because they're educated. Now God ordains his people. God sets his people up. They just followed these, they just followed these isms, and what happened was there was a big war, and in 325 A.D. they finally set up. 325 A.D. after Constantine declared himself to be the next apostle in the succession, it was set up against those who had the Trinity, and this is a false dichotomy, and the. Unit, the Unitarian or Unit, um, Unitarian and the Trinitarian, Trinitarian. Now, 
this was the the people like the Baptists today, the Baptists, the Roman Catholics, the Pentecostals, and over here you had the Arians, you had the Priscillians, you had the Bogo Mills. Even the Pentecostals at first were actually more Unitarian than eventually they became Trinitarian and fall, fell in line with everybody else. But the, Trini, the Pentecostals used to be over here in the, the Unitarian kind of side who they believed in one God, not the three gods of the Roman Catholics. And the Methodists, they believe in that. The three God system. And over here you have the Sabalus and Sabalus and Sabalianism, Arians and the Arianism, the Priscillians, the Bogo Mills, and even Theophilus, or sorry, even, ah, uh, sorry, even Tertullian, they say, was, became a Montanist, so Montanist, because he was so sick of all the corruption in these people right here. And this, like I said, this is a false dichotomy. This is where all of these isms come from. Whoever wins the war or has the most money or is the most popular or a governor, right? They're the ones who get to write history, not the, the poor people who you never even heard of. And the simple profession of Scripture is that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that's where all of this stuff comes from, all of these isms, dispensationalism, that's... Schofield stuff, and he puts a seven dispensations, but dispensation doesn't even mean, uh, doesn't even have to do with the succession of time. So the old covenant and the new covenant, the old covenant was the Mosaic temple with the priests and the sacrifices and everything, and now that's been done away because that was all symbolic, and now we look at those things and realize that those were shadows of the very images of Christ. We know that now he, the, the Ark of the Covenant is our heart, and Christ dwells in our hearts as, as the body, and we are each just a, a member of that body of Christ. And we are the body upon the earth, and he's the head in the heavenlies. And now our hearts are sprinkled. They used to sprinkle the Ark of the Covenant seven times. We're in a spiritual Passover. We have a spiritual Day of Atonement, spiritual Jubilee, and all of those things were spiritual. We love. We love God and love the brethren and love our enemies because we give them the truth. And in turn, we're persecuted, hated, and we suffer. And that's how we know we're heirs and joint heirs to Christ. So, I hope y'all learned something from this. I hope this helps and I hope y'all continue watching. Alright. Thanks, y'all. I'll see y'all next time. Bye.